Hi everybody, welcome back. We are still talking about folk tales and you know, you know what? People all around the world love listening to stories and telling stories. And some of the stories told around the world are quite similar to each other. So even though the story may have originated somewhere different in the world, they can still be similar. So let's kind of think back to our last lesson and the story we talked about, Tom Thumb. So let's think, what's a folktale? Remember we talked about a folktale in our last lesson and a folktale was a story that was told many, many years ago um, that was made up, but people would tell it over and over again. And we recently just started writing down folktales, just not very long ago at all. And so these are stories that are gonna continue on for the rest of our lives too, hopefully. So is a folktale true? Make believe. Fake tale, a folk tale is make believe because things in it don't really happen. Like we don't know anybody that's really the size of our thumb. All right, so how do you know that Tom Thumb is make believe or fictional? Because he was the size of our thumb. That's, that's not something that we really see. That doesn't really happen. Which country or land did the story of Tom Thumb originate? That's right, it happened in England. All right, so Tom Thumb was able to do many great things even though he was no bigger than the size of our thumb. Today, we're gonna hear a story that comes from a different land but whose main character is also very tiny, just like Tom Thumb. So I'm gonna share my screen so you can see what story we're gonna to read today. I can get it over there. There we go. Let me put it in present mode. There we go. Today we are gonna to read the story Thumbelina. Okay, and today's folktale Thumbelina was written down in Denmark long, long ago. So let me, let me get to my, I'm gonna pass the vocabulary first, go back to it. And Denmark, do you see the little circles? Denmark is those teeny tiny little circles, okay? There's Denmark right here. And in, De sorry, and it was written by a man named Hans Christian Andersen. And he has written many stories and folk tales that you've heard, but this is today, this is the one we're looking at is Thumbelina, okay? So I want you to ask yourself as we read through, how is this small girl's life similar or different to Tom Thumb's life? Okay, but first let's go back and look at our vocabulary. Remember our vocabulary are words that we might not know, but we're gonna see in our story. So dwelling, dwelling is a place such as a structure or den, for example, in which people or animals live. Peter Rabbit left his dwelling to sneak into the farmer's vegetable patch. Extravagance, it means luxury. The king's daughter had every extravagance. She was given everything she could ever want. Foreign means unfamiliar. Johnny's new bed made his bedroom a foreign place. Fragrant means having a sweet or pleasant smell. In the spring, fragrant flowers bloom at the side of Penny's house. Scarcely, barely, almost not. The lemons were so sour that Truman was scarcely able to eat them. Barely able to eat them. All right, so like I said, this story is taking place in Denmark. So let's get started with our story. Ready? Once a woman who wanted a child more than anything in the world, at last in loneliness and sorrow, she went to a wise old woman and spoke of her desire. Why did the woman go see the wise old woman? Yeah, because she really wanted something very, very badly. And that woman may have been able to help her out. That's an easy, that's as easy as winking, said the wise old woman. Take this seed and plant it in a flower pot filled with good, rich earth. Water it carefully and guard it very well. The woman did as the wise old woman had said. The first time she watered the seed, a large and brilliant flower sprang up. It was still a bud, its petals tightly closed. The woman bent to kiss the flower, 
but the moment her lips touched the silky petals, they began to open. The woman could not believe her eyes. There inside sat a tiny little girl. She was perfectly formed, as graceful as the flower from which she'd come. When the woman held her, she discovered that the tiny girl was actually the size of her thumb. Remember, she was barely or hardly, the girl was barely as tall as the woman's thumb. She was tiny. Though she was a wonderful child in every way, she never grew at all. She was called Thumbelina and was treated with great extravagance and care. It means that she lived a life of luxury and had everything she could ever want or need. Her cradle was a polished walnut shell. Each night she slept between fresh flower petals. In the daytime, she liked to sit on a table and sing in the sun. Her voice was very beautiful, high and haunting and silvery. One night as she lay sleeping, a toad hopped in at the window. What a lovely wife for my son, she said. Without even looking around her, she took up the walnut shell, hopped off with it in the garden. Do you think you'd like to have a toad for a husband or wife? Remember, a toad is a type of frog. It's big, ugly. I don't think I'd want to marry a frog. Hmm. Oh, my. Here, look what I brought you, said the toad proudly to her son. But the only sound he could utter was, bro, bro, bro. Don't talk loud or you will wake her, complained the mother toad. She might still run away from us. So the mother toad and her son went back to their home near the stream's edge. They placed Thumbelina on a lily pad in the middle of the water so she could not escape. In the morning, Thumbelina woke up and looked all around her at the great arching sky. She felt her lily pad rock with the motion of the stream and cried out in terror. Why do you think she might be frightened? I'd be afraid too if I went to sleep in my walnut and then woke up on a lily pad somewhere I didn't know. I'd be afraid. The mother toad and her son heard Thumbelina crying and went to see what was the matter. Thinking that Thumbelina was just crying out of loneliness, they ignored her and returned to making wedding plans. Upon hearing her sobs, a fish swimming in the water below came to the surface and looked curiously at Thumbelina. A butterfly also heard her cries and flew over to see what was wrong. Oh, please help me, she said. I must get away from here. And so the fish began to gnaw at the lily stalk with his sharp little teeth. So a lily stalk is actually under the water and you can kind of see it right here. And it holds it down into the um, ground so the lily pad doesn't go anywhere. And then a fish came along and nibbled it apart so now they can move the lily pad around. Um, where were we? At last the leaf broke free and floated down the stream. Away went Thumbelina, gently spinning with the current. Gradually her fear left her and she began to enjoy the journey. Never before had she been outside. Thumbelina floated down the river far, far away from the mother toad and her son. It was summertime and she spent the next several months drifting peacefully from place to place along the shores. When it rained, she slept under a large spreading leaf to shelter herself from the rain. For food, she sipped nectar from the flowers, ate wild berries, and drank the dew that lay on the leaves. Um, so dew is drops of water that form at nighttime when it's cool. At the all the while, she listened to the birds chirping in the trees above her and made friends with butterflies that floated on the breezes nearby. Before long though, summer came to an end and autumn quickly passed. The cold chill of winter soon filled the air. There were no more berries or for food. All the birds and butterflies had disappeared. Thumbelina was cold and hungry. Now she truly was alone and the place was a foreign land to her. Remember, foreign means unfamiliar. What do you think is going to happen to her now? Hmm, I'm looking at my picture for clues, and I see a mouse. Do you think that mouse might help her? Hmm. 
Let's read on and find out. And then it started to snow. The snow came at her in white swirling clouds and she quickly wrapped herself up in a leaf, curled up under a mushroom and tried to keep herself dry. Still, she shivered cold. So what season is it now if summer has ended and autumn has passed? Yeah, it's winter time. So do you think Thumbelina is as happy in the winter as she was in the summer and autumn? No, I don't think she is either. Not far away, a field mouse was gathering some last bits of kindling to burn in her fireplace during the winter. Kindling are little tiny sticks that are dry and twigs that you can use to start a fire with. When she saw Thumbelina, she said, my poor dear, you are nearly frozen with cold. You must come home and spend the winter with me. I have plenty to eat and my home is warm and dry. Thumbelina gracefully accepted the invitation and followed the field mouse to her small hole in the ground. As they descended into the tunnel, Thumbelina realized that she was in the snug, small dwelling of a field mouse. Remember, dwelling is a home. Corn was piled up all around her and it smelled, or and it's, and its smell was in the air. Please, said Thumbelina, could I have a bit of corn to eat? You poor dear thing, Field Man Mouse answered kindly. You had better come into my room and have dinner with me. The two got on well together, and after some days, the Field Mouse invited Thumbelina to work for her and stay the winter. Every day, Thumbelina helped the Field Mouse with her housework and they would spend the rest of the day enjoying a cup of tea and chattering before the fire. Thumbelina soon grew very fond of the field mouse. She was happy to have found such a good and kind friend. All right, so let's take a pause for a minute. Who have we met so far? What were our characters? Thumbelina is our main character. Oh, we've met the toads, the mama toad and the son that she was supposed to marry. We met a fish and a butterfly that were helping Thumbelina, and now we have met the field mouse. Why do you think the mother toad took Thumbelina? Right, she wanted her to marry her son. How does the field mouse treat Thumbelina? How's she been treating her so far? Yeah, she's been very kind to her. Late one evening, the field mouse said to, said to dust the floor and polish everything in the room until it shone. An important visitor was coming to call. This was a mole who was very rich and wore a sleek velvet coat, but he had very poor eyesight and even with his glasses, he could barely see. He hated the sun and mocked all the creatures that lived outdoors. Okay, so the word glasses means the kind of glasses you wore. So you can see him on his little face there. He's got little tiny glasses. So if, I lost my train of thought guys, I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, so the word glasses, it could be other things too. I bet you have heard mom or dad say, or even grandma, grandpa, or whoever you live with say, go get some glasses out of the cabinet. And a glass could be something you drink out of also. So it could be something that you wear on your face to help you see better, or it could be something you drink out of, okay? But in this one, we're going to talk about the glasses on his face. And I've lost my spot. The field mouse, however, was impressed by the mole's riches. She told Thumbelina to sing for him and tell stories of her travels. As he listened to Thumbelina's beautiful voice, the mole fell in love with her. The next time he came to visit, he said he would show them his rooms underground. By the pale light of pieces of torchwood, he led them through a long, twisting passage. Suddenly he, oops, suddenly, he came upon a swallow lying sprawled in the passageway. Thumbelina felt very sorry for the swallow, but the mole kicked at him with his stumpy legs. What a pitiful life to be a bird, he said. A creature who does nothing all day but fly from branch to branch is not prepared for winter. So 
what do you think the, of the mole's actions? Like how he treated the bird. Do you think he's a good person? He doesn't seem like a very nice person. He kicked the bird that was hurt and he kind of made rude comments about him. Yeah. So do you think Thumbelina's actions were nicer than the moles? I do, because she's, she's like, oh, what a poor little creature. So, so far, that mole's not very nice. Hmm. Thumbelina said nothing and let the mole in the field walk on ahead. Goodbye, Swallow, she said. It might have been you who sang to me this summer when all the trees were green. She looked ahead on his soft feathers for a moment, then darted back in fright. Something moved inside him with the slow, steady rhythm of a heartbeat. The bird was not dead. He was merely numb with cold. The warmth of Thumbelina's body had stirred him back to life. Each night after that, she crept out of bed to tend the swallow. As he grew stronger, he told her how he had torn his wing on a thorn brush. The other swallows had flown away, from, away to the warm countries, but he had not been able to keep up with them. At last, he could go no farther and had plummeted to the ground. Thumbelina kept the swallow a secret from the field mouse and the mole. Why do you think she kept them a secret? Yeah, because they weren't very nice about it, was it? Yeah. When spring warmed the earth once more, Thumbelina knew it was time for the swallow to go. His wing had healed now. Each night he fluttered it over and over again, strengthening it for flying. Won't you come with me, he asked her. You could easily sit upon my back and I will carry you away into the leafy woods. But Thumbelina could not bring herself to abandon the field mouse who had kept her from starving. So to abandon someone means to leave them and never come back again. She made a hole in the roof of the passageway and watched longingly as the swallow flew out into the sunshine. She felt that all the pleasures in her life was going with him. Every evening now the mole came to call on Thumbelina. He made her sing until her vo voice grew hoarse, and that means that it becomes weak and scratchy and because she sings so much she can barely talk. Whenever she stopped, he prodded her to continue. This was the way he loved her. How do you think the mole made Thumbelina feel? Do you think she felt loved the way he treated her? Probably not. Why doesn't Thumbelina stick up so why, do, why do you think she doesn't say, hey, I don't like this? She might be scared. Let's keep reading and see if we can find out. Without ever once asking Thumbelina, the mole and the field mouse agreed that she would be married to him in autumn. But Thumbelina did not want to marry the mole, and she wept bitterly whenever she thought of their wedding day. Every morning when the sun rose and ev every evening when it set, she was allowed to go to the door sill and stand outside. In the heat of August, she, the corn had grown as high as forest. When the wind blew the stalks apart, she could see bright pieces of sky. How beautiful it was. She did not know how she would live deep inside the earth with the mole, whom she now despised more than ever. And despise means to dislike something a lot. As the time of her wedding drew closer, she sobbed out of her out her fears to the field mouse. Nonsense, said the field mouse. Don't be stubborn. His velvet coat is handsome and the food in his pantry is fit for a queen. Thumbelina understood that she was then that she was trapped as surely as if she were in a cage. Summer was ending and she knew she would never be able to survive outside through the harsh cold winter months. How does Thumbelina feel? Yeah, she was kind of scared. She felt trapped. And we know she felt trapped. Yeah, it says that she felt trapped as surely as if she were in a cage. But now the wedding day had come. For the last time, she crept to the door sill and st to stand in the sunshine. She knew the mole would never permit her to leave his side. She wept as she felt the warmth upon her face and made ready to go back into the earth. Then suddenly above her, she heard a shower of notes, a glorious morning song. Who do you think it is?
She looked up and there was the swallow. The cold winter is coming again, he said, flying down to her. I've looked for you many times and now I must fly away to the warm countries. Won't you come with me? I'll take you to where it is always summer. This time, Thumbelina did not hesitate. She climbed upon the swallow's back, then he rose up into the sky. They flew over forests and fields, high above mountains with snow-capped peaks. When Thumbelina felt cold in the bleak air, she crept under, in under the swallow's feather. It was so secure and close, a coverlet of soft, the softest down. At last they arrived in the warm countries. The sun beat down upon the earth, and the light was clear as crystal. Lemons and oranges hung on the trees, and the air was fragrant with the smell of spices. Remember, fragrant means a, a smell in the air that smells good. The swallow flew on until they came to a dazzling white palace. In the pillows were, pillars were many nests, and one of these was the swallow's home. I dearly love you and yearn to keep you with me, said the swallow sadly, but I do not think you could live up as high as I do, for the wind, when the wind comes, you might fall. Why don't you take one of the flowers that grow below for your home? At least we shall be neighbors. Thumbelina did not remember that she had lived before in a flower, but the idea seemed to her a good one. The swallow set her gently on the petals of a brilliant colored flower. Then she slid inside. Whoops. But this could not be, she thought. This home was already taken. And I kind of cheated a little bit. Who do you think is living in a flower? Yeah, somebody else that's kind of small like she is. A young man was standing there, shining as if he had been made of glass. A silver crown was on, her he on his head and gauzy wings grew from his back. Isn't he wonderful, Thumbelina thought. Never before had she seen a person just her size. The young man explained to Thumbelina that a small person lived in each of these flowers. He was their king. Then he took off his crown and placed it upon Thumbelina's head. You are so lovely, he said. Won't you be my queen? Thumbelina never thought to refuse. She could tell he was kind by the sound of his voice and the curve of his mouth. She felt that at last she had come home. Then the king declared that there was to be a welcoming party more joyful than any seen before in the land. From all the flowers, men and women came bringing gifts for Thumbelina. But the most wonderful was a pair of tiny wings that could be fastened to her back so she too could dart among the flowers. Everyone danced all night and above them in his nest was the swallow singing for them his most heartwarming tune. All right, let's stop. Pause for a second. Okay, so let's talk about our story Thumbelina, okay? So it was kind of similar to Tom Thumb, not exactly. So who gives the magic seed to the woman in the beginning of the story? You know, the wise old woman. Um, what happens when the woman plants the seed? That beautiful flower grew and then when she went to kiss it, it popped open and Thumbelina was inside. All right, so this story has lots of settings. It takes place in different places. What are some of the settings in this story? I know that she lived with the old woman on a bed of petals, walnut shell. She was on the lily pad with the toads. She was along the shore with the field mouse and with the swallows. So she had lots of different places she lived. There was lots of different settings in this story. How did the swallow help Thumbelina escape the mole at the end of the story? Yeah, remember it was on her wedding day. She was about to go back down and she heard the swallow singing. And he said, come on my back and I'll take you to where summer is all the time. So she, he helped her escape by flying her away from the mole. Um, do you think this story could really happen or is it fiction? It's fiction, it's make-believe, it's not real. How do we know that it's not real? Well, for one, do animals talk? No, 
Do they dress in clothes? No. Do we really know people as big as our thumb? No. So we know that those things can't really happen. So that's how we know it's fiction or make believe. All right, so sometimes in a folk tale, it teaches us a lesson, just like the fables do. So is there a lesson or something we can learn and use in our own lives from this folk tale? Hmm. I think that this story is telling us that even little people can do great, wonderful, big things, just like you guys. You're still little, not quite as big as a thumb, but you're still little, but you can do great, big, wonderful things. So you're gonna continue to do great, big, wonderful things after you go to Google Classroom and answer the questions to goes with this story. Then you will go on and do whatever great, big, wonderful things you can. Okay guys, I'll see you next time. Bye.